It is a blessing to be here with you this morning. Amen. We're going to talk about something that, in my estimation, is of profound significance to the Christian. Uh, I know that uh, each of us have had a difficult week, probably. Lots is going on. Uh, but we're here gathered today in the house of the Lord to worship, and uh, it's a tremendous blessing to see you all and just worship in the spirit of liberty and in truth. I, the, the, waist lot, the, the lockdown is not good for my waistline. I, I went to put my pants on this morning, and uh, I had two pairs, and neither of them uh, could be buttoned up. So uh, I, uh, I, I'm wearing the only pair of pants that fits me. So you can, you can pardon my uh, ensemble this morning. Let's bow our heads and pray. Our kind Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm nobody and I'm nothing, mm -hmm. and uh, these are your people, and uh, you have given us your word, and uh, I pray this morning that you will speak through me to cleanse my lips and my tongue, that you will bless their hearts, that you will edify them and strengthen them for this life and for this week to come. Lord, give us a message of love and graciousness from your word this morning that will strengthen us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. There's a story that Ty Gibson tells that I think is just really profound. Um, he tells a story about how his young man uh, there was a lot of domestic issues in his home, and uh, his father was very unkind to his mother. There were all these altercations, he was abusive, was verbally abusive, physically abusive, and this was the environment that he grew up in. And uh, it was very, very traumatic for him. And uh, uh, over the course of years, it manifested in his life through misbehavior, through depression, uh, through uh, despair and loneliness. And uh, uh, he found his circumstances to be overwhelming. And he looked at this man who was so unkind to his mother and it, it just caused him an enormous amount of consternation as a young person. And his grades were failing, and he was acting out in school, he was always in trouble, until one day something very profound happened. He had grown up understanding that this particular individual was his father. And his mother brought him aside one day and she said, I want to tell you something. The man who you refer to as father is not your father. And he was like, Say what? Say what? And she said, the man who is your father was always kind to me. He was always kind to me. He was a good man. And from that moment on, Ty Gibson's life changed. He had never met the man who was his father. But the mere conception that a man who was different, who was good, that he came from a place of goodness, of kindness, was sufficient to alter the trajectory of his life. Now, in the Bible, as uh, Elder Ray read this morning, we are told that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit 
of the Lord. It is an, it is an axiom, it is a well-known saying, Amen. that by beholding, we become changed. And so it is of incredible significance to Christians, probably more should be said on the subject in the Christian world, of what we behold. Uh, because there is a tremendous amount of filth in this world, and uh, we watch the filth, we imbibe the filth, then we come to church and we sing praises, and then we go back to the filth. And uh, that's not the way things are supposed to be. This sermon isn't about that. But it is of profound significance that what we behold alters who we are. Amen. This is no more true than with respect to God. And I, I'm going to do something unconventional here this morning. Um, I'm going to ask for two volunteers. If I, if I could have... Um, because I, they're the only two people I know, really, in this church, like really well enough to impose on them. Um, so if I could have um, Pastor Ricky and uh, Elder Ray, if you guys could come up just for a moment. I'm going to impose on you. Okay, I, I'm sorry to do this. We didn't plan it in advance. Okay, so this is totally impromptu. Uh, it may be a total flop. It may not work out. I don't know. All right, gentlemen. If... Um, uh, can you can you all see? Yes. Yeah. Right. If you could just, Pastor Rick, you can come up here and stand up here. And if you could sort of, and I know this is, I mean, you're, you're beautifully put together this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could kind of get down on one elbow on the, on the step here. Like this? That, just like that. Can you all see him? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Now. <laughs> all right. And now, um, Elder Ricky, if you just step a little bit further away here, just behind the, the rostrum. Just, okay, just like that. Okay, that's perfect. All right. Now, if you could hold your arm up like this. This arm? Now, this arm. <coughs> uh, okay, just kind of kind of reach it up towards Elder Ricky. All right. Now, if you could just kind of reach your finger down towards that fellow there on the ground. Oh. What's the matter? Does anybody... Does anybody Recognize that? Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot. That's, That's it. <laughs> Which one was God? Not me. This is Dean Chapel. It's a painting. That's Michelangelo's famous painting. Oh, okay. In the Sistine Chapel. Now, that is a lot of people's conception of God. The problem is, is it's profoundly theologically inaccurate. Amen. Let's analyze for a moment this fellow over here with his finger out like this. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, I just by way of illustration, let us say that there was a boating accident and uh, there was an explosion and a man is thrown into the midst of the sea and he is unconscious. He's breathing, but he's unconscious. And a helicopter is dispatched from the land to come to the man who is in the sea. And they arrive at the location and they look down. The weather is calm. And they look down, hovering above, and they have a rope and they throw the rope out and they, they take the loudspeaker and they say, hello down there. The man is unconscious. Hello down there. If you grab the rope, we will pull you to safety. Hello, hello down there. Take the rope, it's close by you. We'll pull you to safety. The man is unconscious. Well, Bob, he's uh, not responding. Um, I don't know, getting low on fuel. I guess we, uh, we gotta go back. I gotta eat supper tonight with the wife. And they go back to the mainland. What would you think of such a rescue mission? Failure, yeah, yeah. 
Now, let's talk about this fellow here down here on his elbow. All right? Is there a disparity of power between the fellow up here and the fellow down here? All right. There's a tremendous disparity of power. Okay, one guy is up there. This is this is God. This is the representation of God. He's up there, and this fellow here is down here. All right. He's at a tremendous disadvantage. Okay, he's fallen down. Okay, but he's reaching. All right. You know. In the Sistine Chapel picture, the two of their fingers are like this, right? Almost touching, okay, but not quite. What does it say about the individual standing in this position that he is reaching only so far, but not completely? I'll, I'll, I'll just pause there with that thought. The most important thing in the world is seeing God. But more important than seeing God is how you see God. Because if you see God in a way that He is not, you will be changed into that image. It is by beholding that we become changed. So if you see God aright, you will be changed aright. But if you see God wrong, you will be changed or wrong. All right. The time period when the Sistine Chapel was painted was a time period where this was the theology. This was the model. And I would propose to you that things haven't changed all that much. Maybe they haven't changed at all. If you open up your Bible with me to the book of Psalms, two verses uh, really quickly, Psalms 135 and 115, uh, very, very similar thoughts. 115, let's go to 115 first. Sorry, I gave it to you backwards. Psalms 115. Verses 1 to 8. It says, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto your name give glory, for your mercy and for your truth's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He has done so whatsoever things he has pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are what? Light unto them. They that make them are light unto them. So is everyone that trusts in them. The idol is there, it's the work of man's hands, it has an eyes, it has a mouth, it has a nose, but it is cold and it is indifferent. And perhaps it's indifference is the greatest problem with idolatry. It's indifference, it's coldness. And that inevitably speaking becomes the characteristic of the person who worships an idol. They become cold and indifferent because it is a law. By beholding, we become changed. Yes. The idol has no power, it has no life, it has no purpose. And the person who worships an idol has no life, no power, and no purpose. It is an axiom. And so, in this conception of God, how you look at this, all right? How you see him is of such importance. I can tell you in my personal life, my relationship with God was always like a yo-yo. Because the, the onus was on me to make the connection, all right? The onus was on me to seek him out. The onus was on me to stay with him. 
And uh, inevitably speaking, if you make a mistake, the onus is on you to fix it. Right? Because the onus was on you to come to him in the first place. And so that alters the way that you relate with your creator because he is this individual who has his finger out, but he has come no further. He has not stooped to grasp the hand of man. He is a long ways off. If you open up your Bibles with me to Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 10, verse 30. Now, just as a preamble, this is the lawyer who comes to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, he says, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what's in the law? How, what do you see written there? The lawyer answered and said, this is verse 27, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said unto him, You have answered correctly. This do, and you will live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Amen. Jesus tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Now, the Good Samaritan, he comes upon this circumstance where a man has been beaten, he's been thrown into the ditch, he is in despair, he is bloodied, he's on the ground, he's perhaps going to die, perhaps he is dying. And he comes upon that circumstance. Two other people who were practicers, practicers of religion. A certain priest, a certain Levite, they came by, they saw the man on the ground, and they left him. What does the fact that they left him say about the way that they see the God that they worship. It is by beholding that we become changed. They are acting out the natural result of the way that they see God. If they had truly seen the Father, they would behave like the Father. But they had not seen the Father. right? The Samaritan comes along and he picks the man up and he pours in oil and wine into the wounds and he puts him on his own animal and he takes him to an inn and he cares for him. Now let me ask you this. When Jesus says to the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus asked the lawyer, right? The lawyer is a smart guy. Out of these three, the priest, the Levite, and the Samaritan, which of these three was a neighbor unto the man who fell among thieves? The lawyer correctly answers, the Samaritan, the third one. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. Okay. Do you think that God puts his money where his mouth is? Absolutely. So the picture of the Samaritan reaching down and picking up the man who is in the ditch is the picture of your Savior. Amen. Amen. But do we see him like that? I'll tell you another story. This is a regurgitated story. This is a repeat of the story that Jesus told. Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 3 to 7. And uh, 
Luke chapter 15, verses 3 to 7. This is the parable of the lost sheep. There's a man. He has a hundred sheep. One of them goes missing. All right? Now I want you to juxtapose. I want you to juxtapose. Okay? What does that mean? It means I want you to, I want you to combine, I want you to overlay the idea of Michelangelo's God and the shepherd depicted in this story. All right? Juxtapose the two. You've got the guy on the cloud with his finger out. All right? And then you have this shepherd. Okay? He's a shepherd. He's got a hundred sheep. One sheep goes astray. What is the response of the shepherd? The response of the shepherd could be, if Michelangelo's God is correct, like this. Right? But the good shepherd goes out into the storm and he goes searching for the sheep. He goes through the highways and the byways and up into the mountains, through the crags and the valleys, and he hunts for the sheep. It costs him something to go out at night into the storm. And there, in the wilderness, he finds the sheep. Perhaps ready to perish. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Amen. Now, I want you to contrast the picture of the Good Shepherd mm -hmm. with the guy on the cloud. Okay? And I want you to ask yourself, which one is your God? Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. That's your God. That's your God. Now, you'll notice that the shepherd is the one who's good. It's not the sheep who are good. It doesn't say the good shepherd gives his life for the good sheep. Right? I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Right? He's not making a distinction between good sheep and bad sheep. He lays down his life for the bad sheep. And... It is an amazing thing about scriptures. In fact, there's a, there's a real hidden meaning in here about, you know, good sheep, bad sheep. If you look at Romans chapter 3, um, Romans chapter 3 says that there is none who is good, no, not one. So, one of the secrets of the story of the lost sheep is that there aren't any good sheep. The sheep who think that they are good are the sheep who are beyond rescue. Because the Pharisees said we need no Savior. The Pharisees said we are not blind. And Jesus said, if you knew that you were blind, I could help you, right? I could help you see, right? But because you say we see, therefore your sin remains. There are no good sheep, right? The, the Romans chapter 3 talks about the clearing of the field. As you sit here this morning, it is good news that you are not a good sheep. Because if you were a good sheep, in your mind, the onus would be on you. The onus would be on you to justify yourself to God by, with, by your own works. Brother Raymond. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We've gone after their own way. And so, um, if you turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 13,
Now, I prefer Tyndale's translation of this, where he, he translates this to mean love as opposed to charity. So I'm going to read it like that. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all my mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Who is this talking about? I want, to, I want you to think about this from three perspectives, okay? I want you to think about this from the perspective of Satan. I want you to read this as though Satan was speaking. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not love, I am a sounding brass or a tinkling sound. Did Satan speak with the tongues of men and of angels? Mm -hmm. Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not love, I am nothing. Mm -hmm. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not love, it profits me nothing. Now I want you to think about this from the perspective of God. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Do you not think that when God looks down at the plight of humanity from where Adam fell, he was deceived, his kingdom taken from him by a thief, beaten and bruised? When God sees Adam in that circumstance, Do you not think that the God of the scriptures would pull out all the stops to rescue him? Amen. Amen. In fact, he stakes, stakes his kingdom on it. Amen. Jesus said in the parable of the Good Samaritan, This do, and you will live. Do you think that he asks you to do something that he has not done himself? He has done it himself. Amen. I'm going to close with this thought. Well, I said three ways. First Corinthians chapter 13. I want you to read it from your perspective. Read it from your perspective. And ask yourself if these things, if you can say that these are the things that motivate you. And if they are not the things that motivate you, is it because you do not see God in the way that He is? There was a message given to this church in 1888 about the righteousness of Christ. The conception of who God is is foundational. It's foundational. Because the way that you see Him is going to alter who you are. If you see God as an individual who only comes this far to save humanity, mm. how far will you go to save humanity? Mm. No further. Mm. No further. You cannot go any further than your 